Would you join me in prayer as we come to God's Word? Father, we affirm those truths from that song that you alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. And Lord, we ask that you would speak to us by your word. We plead with you that by your spirit we might hear from you now. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in just two nights, many kids all around Wheaton, my five included, will accumulate unhealthy amounts of candy through the process of trick-or-treating. And boy, do we purchase candy in this country. I was doing some research on Halloween, and I discovered that Americans spend an estimated $6 billion a year on Halloween alone. That's second to Christmas in terms of how much we spend on holidays. There's probably a few costumes in there, a lot of candy, a lot of money. But with this holiday come some disturbing features, and that's why some of you don't even celebrate it. Comes a disturbing fascination and even embracing of things that are legitimately scary and legitimately evil. Things like death, witches, and other supernatural beings. In fact, as a country, our fascination with this evil side of life seems to be growing exponentially. This is evidenced by the fact that the horror film genre is booming currently. Hopefully you don't know that. One popular horror movie released this fall grossed approximately $180 million worldwide in the first weekend. It's a record for that type of movie. What we find is that so many people see evil today as entertainment, as an escape from their reality, whether it's through Halloween or through a horror film. But this evening, we're gonna be confronted and reminded of the true reality of evil and its destructive nature as we continue our series in Mark. And we'll see that there's nothing entertaining about it. Well, today's passage comes just after Jesus revealed his power over nature when he calmed the storm in chapter 4. And the last sentence of chapter 4 is a perfect lead-in for us tonight. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 4, there in the last line. And the disciples say this after Jesus has calmed the storm. They say, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And this is the question that we must keep asking as we go through Mark's gospel. Who then is this Jesus? So now coming to chapter 5 this evening, we're going to see who Jesus is in relation to the demonic realm. From this encounter with Jesus, the text compels us to take action. And this passage breaks down quite simply into two sections, verses 1 through 13 and verses 14 to 20. And I believe that each section of our text this evening has an action step for us to take. So the first action step that we see in verses 1 to 13 is that we must behold the unrivaled power of Jesus. We must behold the unrivaled power of Jesus. And the second action step in verses 14 and 20 is that we must respond rightly to Jesus. Behold the unrivaled power of Jesus and respond rightly when that power is revealed. So let's first see how we can behold this unrivaled power of Jesus. I'd venture to say if you were to ask the average person on the street what Jesus is like, you would get some type of Sunday school answer. You'd probably get something like, well, he's loving. He's compassionate, he's smiling all the time, and he loves children. And uh, most of those things are true, by the way. Jesus is loving, he is compassionate beyond measure. I don't believe he's smiling all the time, but he, he uh, he does love children. But the average person probably doesn't first think about Jesus's power. 
But that's what we see on display in verses 1 to 13 of chapter 5. So let's begin reading the text together. And I'm going to read a few verses and then provide some commentary and we'll go through the text that way since it's such a long text. Here it is, Mark chapter 5 starting in verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So in these first two verses, Mark gives us some clues regarding the context of what's going on. Jesus and his disciples have come in multiple boats across the Sea of Galilee to the eastern edge. We're not exactly sure where this is. Scholars are debating even now probably where this exactly is, but we know in the general vicinity where they're landed. And this is a Gentile region, most likely, because there's pigs feeding on the hillside. And Jews don't associate with pigs because pigs are unclean at that time. And so that he's coming into this Gentile region, and this crazy man comes out of the tombs. We learn from the account in the other Gospels that the man was naked, and he runs to him, and we learn more about him in the, pres- the next verses. So let's read on. He lived, in verse 3, he lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Can you imagine that kind of power? For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. This is a key verse here. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out. He was screaming out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus, you can imagine him up on the hillside, and he sees Jesus coming, coming on the boat. When he saw him from afar, he ran, ran headlong to Jesus. He fell down before him. I don't need to tell you, but this is a freaky man. He was isolated. Mark says he was living among the tombs. People had been apparently able to bind him at one point in his life, but now he had grown so strong, no one could even bind him. How would you like that job to bind this man? Probably five men trying to bind him couldn't do it any longer. He was uncontrollable. He had supernatural strength. Beyond that, he constantly screamed. He constantly harmed himself. He was like a character straight out of a horror movie, but it wasn't a movie. And this man sees Jesus in the distance, and he runs to him. In the text, in the original, it's saying that he bowed down or he lay prostrate before Jesus, and the tension continues to rise. So let's pick it up in verse 7. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. Wow. Wow. What a remarkable interchange we have here between Jesus and the man possessed by these demons, or the man who was demonized. What we have here is not a textbook lesson on how to drive out a demon, so please don't take that away from this sermon. Or insights of whether demons have certain locations or realms or places they prefer to dwell. That's not what the text is saying. Instead, we see a power encounter between Jesus, the creator of the entire world, and powerful angelic beings who have rebelled against him. Let's not misunderstand. This was not an equal fight, nor was it ever an equal fight. It kind of reminds me of when my three-year-old son comes up to me and he says, Daddy, let's fight. 
Now you and I both know at that moment this is not gonna be an equal fight and of course I'm not gonna harm my son. But here, this is not an equal fight between God and the demons. Many times we can be deceived, even as Christians, thinking that this cosmic battle between God and Satan and his, Satan's forces is a close one. Somehow there's this, this struggle against good and evil, and we think, oh, who's going to win this one? That's what we see in the movies with the good and evil. That's what we see in TV shows. But that's not the case here. That's faulty thinking, and it's dispelled here in other places throughout Scripture. These powerful demons, even though they're more powerful than any human being, are forced into submission as they recognize the power of their creator. Yes, they are powerful. Yes, they're more powerful than any human being, but they know greater power when they see it. And they know that Jesus has that greater power. So they try to bargain with them. They don't want to be sent into the abyss. We know from other accounts in the Gospels, they don't want to be tormented before their time. They know that their time is short. So they beg Jesus to enter this herd of pigs. And surprisingly, Jesus grants their request. The text says in verse 13 that he gave them permission. Again, showing that Jesus was the one in control. And immediately the demons drive the pigs off the cliff into the sea. This time a Roman legion was known to be 6,000 or so soldiers. And here 2,000 pigs go off the cliff. This man was tormented by hundreds if not thousands of demons. No wonder he was so strong. But this display shows everyone. This man in whom the the spirits dwelt, the herdsmen and the disciples, that the demons had left the man. And it showed them who had the power over them, and that was Jesus. We see this similar permission language in the book of Job when Satan wants to harm Job. The Lord gives him permission, but he doesn't let Satan take Job's life, if you remember. There's some back and forth in that book. And I'll admit, there's much mystery to this. We don't fully understand how God can permit this evil and how he is, uh, of course, he's not evil himself, but he permits this evil and he's even sovereign over the evil in this world. There's a lot of mystery there and God is never to be blamed for it. We don't have time to address it. But the point here is that Jesus is ultimately in control. And he is the one with unrivaled power. There's no contest between him and Satan and his demons. So what does that mean for us today? I doubt anyone's come run up to you in the last week or so screaming naked and submitting to you. So what does that mean for us? Well, as you think about this unrivaled power of Jesus, I would ask you a question. Are you living like you believe it? Are you living like you believe Jesus has this type of power we see on display here? How can you know, you may ask, if, I, if I'm living like that? Well, here's two questions you could ask, two diagnostic questions. First, how do you pray? How do you pray? Simple question. Do you go to Jesus when you're faced with a complex issue? When you're faced with fear about the future, about this country, about something else going on in your life? Or do you go somewhere else? How do you pray? Do you go to the one with the ultimate power or do you go to someone else? Second diagnostic question. Where do you search for answers for life's difficult questions? Maybe you are trying to figure out what is God doing in this world right now? What's he doing in North Korea? What's he doing in our family? How could this be God's will? The question is, where do you search for life's difficult, the answers to life's difficult questions? Is it a self-help book? Is it a psychologist? Is it an extra degree? Is it a friend? Or do you go to his word? Do you go to the word of God as your final authority for life, 
for doctrine, for how to live. I'm not against counselors, I'm not against education, I'm not against friends, but where do you go when you have the need? Do you go to the real source of power or do you go to somewhere else? Well, maybe this evening you need to ask Jesus to open your eyes afresh so that you can behold his unrivaled power on display through his word and in your life. As we encounter Jesus in the text, so our first action is to behold his unrivaled power. Now in verses 14 to 20, we see another action step, and that is to rightly respond to this power, rightly respond to Jesus as we see this power revealed. You know, sometimes you can have a situation where you respond wrongly to that situation. And as I was thinking about it, I thought about a time when my wife planned this incredible surprise for me. We were living in Arizona at the time, and she decided to surprise me by inviting a good friend of mine from New Mexico to fly in. She got him at the airport, came through the doors, and was surprising me on my birthday. And I think we went to a son's basketball game. It was incredible what my wife did. And don't, don't, tell me, don't ask me why, but when, when my friend walked through that door, I was with another friend at the time, I was sitting on the couch, and I saw my friend from New Mexico. For some reason, I just said, oh, hey, Blake. That was not a good response, okay? Uh, I did hear about that later, about I spent weeks, if not months, planning this thing, and all I got was, oh, hey, Blake, glad you're here. That's a way uh, not to respond to a situation. And here in verses 14 to 17, we see another example of how not to respond when we encounter Jesus and his power. It's actually a tragic and wrong way to respond. Let me read it, starting in verse 14. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus, and they saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. So here we see those who are taking care of the pigs running off in fear. They've lost their livelihood. This was their business. And they're proclaiming how Jesus had destroyed their pigs. And they probably threw in, and that crazy man, he's fine now. But really, we don't have a business anymore. Look what this man did. So all the people from the town, from the country came to see what had happened. And the text says they were afraid. What were they afraid of? Well, maybe they thought that Jesus would ruin their businesses, just like the herdmen who had lost their pigs. They, they were afraid of economic loss. Or maybe they thought Jesus was more dangerous even than this man. If he could subdue this man, who was Jesus? So they were afraid. But maybe they just didn't want their lives to be disrupted. They saw this crazy man, now well, and they thought, well, life is probably going to be a little normal right now. We don't need any more theatrics. Well, before we judge these people, we need to admit that we can have similar reactions when we encounter the power of Jesus. We may hear firsthand testimony about a transformed life. We may hear that at church or in a Bible study or just talking with someone. I just heard one the other day that was amazing how somebody was transformed Addicted to pornography, addicted to alcohol, and Jesus transformed his life. So we may hear a testimony like that, but then not want to address areas of our own lives that Jesus wants to transform in us. We may feel convicted or compelled to act in a time of, in, in the Word, when we're reading the Word, or when we hear a sermon, but we don't act because it might involve too big a step of faith or it might be too uncomfortable. There may be someone here this evening who has put Jesus at arm's length for a number of years, if not an entire lifetime. 
because you don't want him to disturb your life. You know that he's powerful. You know that he's changed people's lives around you. That's, that's probably why you're here. But if you're honest, you're scared of what he might ask you to do. If you completely surrender your life to him, and if that's you this evening, you are being deceived. And that's a tragic decision. It's a tragic decision to tell Jesus to go the other way when you see his power and what he's done and who he is. Well, then in verse 18, we see a proper response to Jesus. And this comes surprisingly from the man who had been possessed by demons. Listen in verse 18. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. There's that same word. The townspeople had begged Jesus to leave, and now this man begs Jesus that he might be with him. But again, we encounter another surprise. And he, Jesus, did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. So here, ironically, Jesus doesn't let this man come with him even though he's begging. Instead, he sends them out on a mission. The first missionary that we see sent out here in the text in Mark, and he's sent to his own people, his own family, his own friends, or former friends, before he had this condition. If you're like me, you may find that sometimes it's more comfortable to go around the world and kind of be with Jesus and share the gospel than it is to go down the street and share with your neighbors. One of our former pastors here at College Church, Bruce Wilson, used to say there's no sanctification by aviation. That means you don't get more spiritually mature or changed by going on an airplane. The point is you don't need to go anywhere to make a difference for Jesus Christ. A skeptic looking at this story, could say that Jesus wasn't very successful in this story. He was banned from preaching to an entire region. He destroyed some people's pig business. They probably hated him for life. And only one man out of the countless others was healed and saved in this story. But in God's economy, that's not a loss. This is a huge victory. Because I'm convinced that Jesus came to this region of the Gentiles precisely for that one man. He pursued him even as the man came and submitted himself before Jesus. And he granted this man mercy even though he didn't deserve it. And he rescued him. And every single one of us who knows Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior this evening knows that experience. Knows that everyone who comes to Jesus was first pursued by Jesus and that we have to come to him empty-handed in need of his grace and his mercy. And many of you have experienced that and you have life and you have life to the full. But perhaps tonight you've wandered in here, you just came in through those doors and you're lost. You're not lost physically, you, you found a place to sit, but you're lost spiritually. You're in bondage to your passions and your desires. And you need to be set free. I'm here tonight to tell you that same Jesus who healed the man with the demons wants to heal you tonight. He wants to set you free. He wants to give you a new life, to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And he alone can do that because he lived a perfect life And he died on the cross for our sins and he rose again three days later so that we might have life. So if that's you today, would you trust in Jesus? Many of us here tonight have done just that. 
We've heard that message our whole lives or for a number of years. But perhaps we've lost our freshness and our joy in proclaiming this good news to others. Tonight we may need to revisit what Jesus has done for us, how he's had mercy on us. God wasn't lucky to get us on his team. We're the lucky ones. We're the ones who were pursued. We're the ones who had nothing to offer. And yet he loved us while we were still sinners. Maybe you need to be reminded of that again this evening. And perhaps it's that God is calling you to take the next step in proclaiming the gospel to those right around you, right where he's placed you. And you need to meditate first on how much Jesus has done for you. Ask him to revive the wonder of the cross in your heart. Perhaps this evening you value being comfortable and you enjoy being in that holy huddle that Pastor Moody was talking about this morning. You love only being around Christians because it's comfortable. You like it. You never have to do anything that's too crazy. Well, if that's you, that is disobeying your Savior. Jesus is calling you into your neighborhood. He's calling you into your family. He's put you there for a reason. He's calling you into your workplace to be a witness for him, to tell others what he has done for you, how much mercy he has had on you. We cannot satisfy by being in this holy huddle and wait until we get to heaven and then it gets a little bit better. We're put here on earth. We've been saved so that we can proclaim this message to others. And so are you doing that? I'd ask you just to think of one person in your life right now that God's put around you in your life. Could be a family member, could be a friend, could be a coworker. I guarantee God will bring someone to mind right now. Who is that that he's wanting you to reach out to? Who is that that you keep making an excuse not to reach out to? Would you do that this week? Would you take the next step? Where is Jesus sending you? Where is he sending me? It's easy. He's already sent us. Wherever you are right now, where you live, where you work, where you go to school, the family that he's placed you in, the Lord is sovereign over all these things. He's put you there for a reason. If you work in a Christian institution, if you work at a church like I do, we have to work a little bit harder to get around people who don't yet know Jesus. But I'm making that commitment and I hope you will too. So what's our motivation for doing this? Our motivation is the same as the man who is healed from the demons. Our motivation is that we remember what Jesus has done for us. We remember his mercy. We remember his compassion. And we desire to obey our Savior and to be his disciples. So as we close, I want you to consider Are you beholding the unrivaled power of Jesus? Do you need to be reminded that the God you serve, the Savior that you serve, is unrivaled in power? He's unrivaled in authority. And are you responding to that power by going out into your world, reaching people that no one else could reach, giving testimony to what he's done in your life? If not, Go do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. We serve a Savior who is Lord over all. And here we see that he's Lord over the demonic. Let's go tell others all about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love toward us, how you pursued us when we weren't willing and worthy of being pursued how you gave us new life. Lord, help us to remember afresh what that was like, what, that, what reality awaited us apart from you. And Lord, help us to be faithful witnesses to those you've put in our lives. Pray that in Christ's name, amen.